Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Michael Haspel, and today I bring you an interview with Mark Graham. Mark is an author, a speaker, a story coach, shamanic practitioner, and a whiskey aficionado. Uh, he likes my Macallan 18, one ice cube. <laughs> His novels include Of Ashes and Dust, which was released in March of 2017, Song of Songs, a novel of the Queen of Sheba, which will come out in May 2019, and Prince of the West, which comes out in late 2019. He is also the developer of the Runes for Writers Creativity Boosting System. And uh, when not on stage or in a pub or bound to his computer, he can be found uh, traipsing around the foothills and mountains with his wife and their greater Swiss mountain dog. So please enjoy, and uh, after the intro, I give you Mark Graham. Five, four, three, hands on keys, turn. Greetings and felicitations. I am here today with author Mark Graham. And uh, Mark, I will have uh, done like a really quick bio, but uh, if you would just tell us like about yourself and and what you do. Sure. Um, so I've been a, a storyteller most of my life. I've been f- formally writing and, and chasing this uh this crazy dream of, of published authordom for about 20 years or so. Uh, during that time, I've also been engaged in some more esoteric studies. So it's been a lot of fun, really, as, um, as, as the writing and some of the more fantastical elements in the stories have kind of shown up in these other studies that I've been doing. Um, so yeah, just a, uh, a storyteller, an explorer, and uh, and an engineer to uh, to pay the bills. Yeah, we kind of have that in common where we're doing right. like <laughs> the left left brain and right brain stuff at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's a little schizophrenic sometimes, but uh, it makes life interesting. Yeah, and tell people like what kind of what genres you write in. Yeah, so I've written primarily uh, historical. My first novel um, was actually more of a a, a a western or frontier fiction. It wasn't you know Louis L'Amour style Western, uh, but set in the American Civil War and the American West uh, in the 1800s. That came out in uh, March of 2017. I have, I'm really excited. I've got two books that should be out next year. Uh, One, I just got the cover today and I'm really, really excited about that. Um, And that is called Song of Songs, a novel of the Queen of Sheba. So it's a a reimagining of that uh, familiar story. That will be out from Blank Slate Press in May of next year, 2019. And then a third book, we're still uh, working on the title. Uh, the working title is Prince of the West. It's a um, about a round-the-world voyage around a thousand years before Columbus. Um, so that one is uh, a bigger stretch on the imagination, but uh, just a lot of fun. And that will be out probably... I'm thinking fourth quarter, uh, 2019, or uh, maybe early in 2020. And then my current project that I've been working on is a nonfiction piece, and it is a uh, a creativity tool, a tool for writers or storytellers, really, I think in any medium, and I'm calling it Runes for Writers. And, uh, and that's just been a lot of fun to develop, kind of taking both my, my years and my experience in crafting stories and weaving in some of the uh, more esoteric pursuits that I've, that I've uh, kind of stumbled along during the years as well. Yeah. That Prince of the West sounds really cool. Like, <laughs> and, that, and for- <laughs> yeah. that was just a lot of fun to put together. And it's one of those things, you know, you, you pick up, 
different ideas along the way. Um, I think the spark for this one, I don't know if you're familiar with the Piri race map. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So That's, this is that the one that like Graham Hancock talks about? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this was a map that was discovered in, uh, I guess it was Istanbul at the time, uh, Constantinople. It's discovered in a library there in like 1927, I think. Um, but it's dated to the early, early 1500s. Um, so that the Turks had this map that showed the Western Hemisphere in really good detail and arguably in detail that was better than any other maps to come along for 300 years uh, after that. So uh, it's just one of those interesting uh, nuggets of information that I tucked away uh, for I don't know how long. And then one day I was thinking, well, how, what would enable such an accurate map to have been created arguably before the discovery? I think it shows a portion of the west coast of Panama, um, or maybe I guess the south coast of Panama, but on the Pacific side before Balboa had found the Pacific oh, Ocean. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's it's like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I kind of just began crafting a story of how, how would that happen and how would that map wind up in Turkey, who was pretty much blockaded from the Atlantic during that time uh, by the Western uh, Christian kingdoms. So really started thinking about that. And initially I was going to have my, my protagonist be a Turkish prince. Um, but then more and more, as I start working on that, it's like they, there really wouldn't have been access to, uh, to the Western seas. So I kept moving my character farther and farther West, finally wound up in Spain um, during the Visigothic period. Um, and, and the story just kind of took off from there. Wow. So going all the way back to the Visigoths. Yeah. 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 That's really, really cool. And then <laughs> before we get into the runes for writers stuff, which I adore. Um, yeah. We need to talk about song of songs for a little while. And, sure. and uh, the, the funny thing about it is, and I am being completely sincere here. Uh, I got to read uh, song of songs at, kind of as it was being written. Yeah. And for for someone who kind of prides themselves on being able to like pick up a pattern on a story that I that I already know, <laughs> it went right over my head until <laughs> until we were well into the story, and then I was like, "Wait a minute, this is <laughs> <laughs> these names are starting to sound really familiar." You're right. Yeah, and that one was left, you know, because you know you know the story very well. Um, you know, I know the story. Uh, growing up before I turned into a heathen for my days in Sunday school. Um, it, but it was really fun to try to figure out, you know, how to spin it, how to, you know, make it not just a rehashing of, of the same old story that's been done a dozen times in my lifetime. Um, you know, let alone all the, the different versions that have been done before then. Um, so I really dug into, um, Ethiopian legend into the Arabic legends, um, you know, the, the biblical story as well. And then Masonic lore, um, cause the, you know, and, and really it, it's queen of Sheba, but really I think at least equal part of the story is the building of the temple, which is the foundation myth of, of Freemasonry. Um, and, and that one was fun in that, um, in, in masonry, there are a handful of legends that I've only found there uh, once. And I, I always have to, you know, well, how did I find this? Where, where was that again? Um, it's, it's a really difficult legend to find, but it talks about the Queen of Sheba coming to Jerusalem because she's heard of this magnificent temple being built. In the Bible story, it's because she's heard of Solomon's great wisdom. Um, but she comes and is just enchanted by the temple builder and it creates this this rivalry and this um you know a, a real difficulty between the king who's having the temple built and the guy who's actually building it for him and that i thought was just a really rich story and and that's kind of the tack that i took with this one uh so and then the names 
uh, were interesting. So Makeda uh, is my queen of Sheba, and in the, and she is the queen of Sheba in the Ethiopian legend, uh, the Keber Nagast, uh, the book of the the glory of kings, is the Ethiopian kind of dynastic tradition, and it purports to to follow the imperial line from from its foundation um, with the son of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. And even down to the, I think it was in the 70s, uh, when Haile Selassie was deposed, he was the last uh, reigning descendant of this dynasty that began oh, with King Oh, wow. With I, King, didn't, I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, and his his son, or grand, I think it's his grandson now, is essentially the emperor in exile. Um, and is and claims descent from Makeda and Solomon. Um, so that's and and you may have noticed in uh, I don't know if I, I may not have had it in there. So in my Oak Island book, um, the our female archaeologist, her middle name is Selassie. Oh no way! Uh, <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really, you know, I, and that's been a lot of fun. You know, my first book was kind of a one-off, um, but all, uh, you know, both Song of Songs and Prince of the West and the the book that I'm I'm wrapping up right now um, are all kind of in the same universe, even though the stories are very very different. Um, you know the the fact of Makeda coming to Urusalim to see this temple built is true in Prince of the West, and it's true in um, in the Oak Island story. So it's it's just it's been a lot of fun to kind of figure out how I could weave all of these together. Yeah, and I, and I'm going to chime in here because uh, Urusalim that's that's uh, one of the names that kind of threw me off until I because I was just reading it. And then when I said it out loud, I went, wait a minute, that's Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, so, and that was fun in the, in the research. So a lot of it, um, so a lot of the, the names actually came from, um, not the Nakamati schools, the uh, El Amarna tablets, which was a cache of cuneiform tablets that were found in uh, Akhtaten. Um, Oh, Akhenaten. that's uh, yeah. That's that's uh, my, one of my boys. That's Akhenaten. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's the heretic king of Egypt. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, some of the fun with this, uh, what going through these letters, uh, there's a technically, I think he's an amateur archaeologist, though he would probably say he's as good as any, anyone else. Um, but David Roll is is the guy's name, and he has gone through and pretty much turned the official Egyptian chronology uh, and dynastic chronology on its head and is has radically shifted the dates uh, claiming that, you know, you know, let's say that I'm making numbers up, but the, the 12th and the, the 13th dynasty actually occurred at the same time in rival kingdoms. So he's pulled, you know, squeezed years, you know, centuries out of the, uh, the, the traditional chronology of Egypt, um, which and that puts Akhenaten much much closer to the period of the temple building. You know, I, I think uh, in the official chronology, he's like 350 years before the temple could have been built, and in this case, he's maybe a generation. So oh, the, that close, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, Roll and a few other people have gone through the El Amarna tablets and identified events, biblical events or, or, you know, myths and legends, identified those with things that are being written about in those tablets. Um, you know, there's the king of Jerusalem writes to Akhenaten saying, hey, I've got this, this crazy guy, Tadwa, that's pillaging my lands. He's, you know, trying to sack my city. He's doing all these things. And, you know, a few tablets later, you've got Tadwa writing to the <laughs> to the pharaoh, saying, "Oh, you know, great sun in the sky, uh, you know, just th these fawning letters of diplomacy, saying, you know, your your son Tadwa has taken Urusalim from, um, you know, from the previous holder, and I, I bow before you, and you know, all these other things." Um, 
So I really lifted a lot of the names from from those tablets. So Tadwa, I have made um, to replace King David in in legend, and the names are actually very similar when you uh, get into uh, the the root words, the root meaning of the words, um, and take them back into older, more archaic languages. Uh, so that's you know that that was a lot of the fun and just kind of tweaking some of the names um, and, uh, and 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 playing with them. So the root is still the more familiar name. I've just kind of shifted it uh, to to fit the historical period a little bit better. Yeah, it's it's it really is just pretty awesome too. It's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 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 one of the interesting things with that as you know in the familiar biblical story. Um, you know, Absalom is, is one of David's sons. And uh, I think it's a Walt Whitman, I think, that wrote the poem that is kind of similar to that. Um, but as I looked at it, it's like Absalom, that kind of means or could be read to to, uh, to be interpreted as the father of Solomon. Um, and so that's kind of where that portion of the oh, story comes from okay. um, with that kind of questionable lineage there for uh for the Solomon character. Okay. And then and just to, just to like center this in history for, for our listeners, Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti and yes. he was yes. the father of Tutankhamun, who yes. is King Tut. So yep. that kind of centers that that's where that, that comes into play. Yeah. Because everyone's and, heard of King Tut, but not exactly. everyone has heard right. of Akhenaten. Right. Yeah. So that was right in that time period. And the pharaoh in in this story is Horemheb, who was Tut's uh, basically chief general, chief of staff of his military. Um, in fact, when the, uh, the King Tut collection came through at the museum in Denver. Uh, I guess it was last year, I think they had some of the relics from Horemheb's reign. And it's like that, that's my Pharaoh. That's my guy from the book. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah. So it was so cool to be able to, to see a piece of that. And, um, you know, literally to put a face to the name, I think they had his death, uh, his death mask. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. All right. Now I'm going to put you on the spot here. And this is not a question or that has to do with your book, or maybe it does. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure you did not cover this, but I just, I'm curious because we just dropped a ton of knowledge on people <laughs> in like 10 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, and if you can't answer this, then it, that's cool too. But sure. what, how much stock do you put into the, the kind of theory? It's kind of conspiracy theory that, uh, the Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia and then the Queen of Sheba brought it back with her. Yeah, so that'll be book two or three. Of the- <laughs> oh, okay. so it does. T- See, I knew it tied in. That's why. Yeah, I did that. yeah, and it's you know, I mean, I had a, a lot of fun, and I don't know if you picked up on this. The Ark of the Covenant is in book one. Um, no, I did not pick up. On okay. That. <laughs> um, so it's you know, I've, I've, I still actually need to uh, to ponder on that a little bit more to see exactly how I'm going to do it. Um, but at least a part of the Ark of the Covenant um, is likely to be discovered in Ethiopia. I'll just, I'll, I'll go that far. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Really cool. So based on all the questions you've answered so far, I think we can answer this one pretty easily, <laughs> but I, I'm just going to ask some of these canned questions that I have. Um, would you think of yourself as a pantser or a plotter? Like somebody who outlines everything or somebody who just writes by the seat of their pants? That's a great question. And I'm, I have been a pantser, um, you know, for, I'd say most of the three books, uh, that are coming up or that are published or soon to be published, um, were kind of pantsing method. And I, through trial and error, I've discovered that I really <laughs> don't like that. Um, it, it, there's freedom in it. You know, there's a lot of, of fun to be had there. But, you know, I've rewritten all of those stories uh, almost in their entirety, you know, at least two times, maybe three or four times for some of them. And I have another couple of dozen books in my head that need to get out. So if it takes me as long to write the rest of these as it took for those, <laughs> there's no way that yeah. I can get them all done. So I'm really moving more into uh, a plotting um, 
kind of framework. Uh, this last book um, that that I just wrapped up, uh, that I'm develop still still wrapping up, I guess, but getting ready to start shopping around, um, is a contemporary thriller set around the Oak Island mystery in Nova Scotia. And that one, I actually took about six months before I wrote a word to nail down my research to get a solid outline, at least a chapter, uh, you know, at, at the chapter level to know what was happening. Um, and that went a lot, lot faster than the other one, than the previous ones. And it, I still felt that I had freedom as I'm in a scene. I, I still found some surprising twists and turns that the characters were springing on me. Um, but I, I knew where I was going and, and what I was writing toward. And I found that to be a, a lot more efficient process. Yeah. And I've switched from being pantser to more, to more, uh, plotter for the same reasons. And I found <laughs> like, I found that, uh, sometimes I discover a fact that I'm just like, uh, oh, this is, this is writing itself. Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like I can't, I can't make it up. This actually happened. And it's so cool that now I have to put it in the story. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, there's still opportunity for that. Right. You know, I mean, a lot of people, you know, the, the panthers look at, at plotters and say, oh, how can you write so rigidly? But there's still, you know, I mean, when the muse tur- spins you in a different direction, you go with it. Um, you know, so it still allows for a lot of freedom, but just, you know, um, I think, yeah, it's just much more efficient and I forget it's either James Patterson or Stephen King. I, f- I forget which, but ultimately said that everyone ultimately plots out and plans their novel and, and outlines their novel. It's just some people do it in five pages and some people do it with a complete draft that they then have to go back and <laughs> rewrite. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I, I'd, I'd rather, you know, take an outline and do a plot twist on it than the entire story to try and then try to go back yeah, and do all the just, continuity checks. Just call checks. your first draft like an, uh, a prose outline. Exactly. And yeah, a 300 page right. outline. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to help people with that, with like developing plot points and characterizations and everything ahead of time, you have developed a really pretty unique and really cool brainstorming tool that the runes for writers. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm really excited about this and I appreciate your giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are familiar with tarot and there's actually a book that came out several years ago, tarot for writers, um, as a means of you know, using tarot outline or, um, uh, tarot spreads to, to brainstorm, to troubleshoot your story, to, to kind of get into that. And in my um, my personal studies, I've I've been studying the runes um, for a while, and was uh, kind of took the beginning of the year as kind of a reset. And I actually went through um, almost six months, you know, twenty four weeks of meditating on one rune a day for a week at a time. Um, wow! Yeah. And as I was going through this, um, kind of looking at, at at the, uh, it was actually the Nalthese rune. This is what I love about this. So Nalthese is, um, the rune has a meaning and it means in this case, need or necessity. And a lot of times, um, kind of going off track, but a lot of times people see this as, you know, there's an emergency coming up. You need to stop and, and take stock. But I look at this rune as the necessity that is the mother of invention. And I was, as I was studying that rune that week, this idea popped into my head of using the runes similar to the tarot cards in these outlines as a means of developing characters, of troubleshooting story elements, of crafting scenes. And as I thought about more and more, I actually found a, a layout that can help you outline your entire story and the major story elements from start to finish. Um, and so, I mean, this entire conception kind of popped into my head in one moment. And then within about two or three weeks, I think I had the cards designed. Um, shortly after that, I got the idea for a set of dice, um, which I had prototypes within another three weeks. So all of this kind of started coming into being, I think, in May. 
and we are now uh, in full prototype. Uh, I actually have a crowdfunding campaign to um, uh, to help uh, fund some of this. The uh, the dice were were pretty expensive to get crafted. Um, you know the cards aren't hugely expensive, but they're not cheap. Um, but we're really looking to get this whole system developed. Uh, I'm writing the book, the companion guide to go along with this. Um, we've also got a, a set of tiles that kind of mirror the cards as well, the rune cards. And um, yeah, that campaign is up and running. We've got about five or six weeks left on that. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to be able to start shipping these by the holidays. Yeah, and and to our listeners, I will include all the links and information to get to this stuff in the show notes, so you can just go ahead and grab them. That'd be but great, I thanks. like the idea of that that rune being kind of an emergency because it we've been covering uh, Joseph Campbell and you know the monomyth. Yeah, and what's interesting is that like folks think that crisis is always negative, but but that's not true. Right, a crisis could could be positive, and nothing. Nothing can change if you're in a position of comfort. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. I mean, with without a crisis, the hero is never going to leave the ordinary world. Um, it, it's that that crisis point, that challenge, that that forces growth. You know, we we don't have growth or growth without opposition. You know, I mean, without gravity, trees you know, would be vines. If, if gravity were, were weaker, we wouldn't have trees because there wouldn't be anything to fight against. Um, so yeah, it's, it's that opposition that, that makes the journey even reasonable, even, uh, conceivable. And it's, it's that tension between the antagonistic and protagonistic forces that creates story. So, you know, you, uh, it's it's not always easy to be stoic and philosophical as challenges strike us in life. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <no lie. laughs> from from a you know from a, a distant standpoint, yeah, it's oh yeah, that's just an opportunity for growth. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it it ties into uh, for those that listen to Jocko Willink. Also, he always talks about saying good when when faced with adversity, <laughs> and and then just trying to find the good in that right. because it's not always bad. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing that I really like about your system is, is I've advocated for using um, s- certain systems, like even using the board game uh, Dixit, which has a bunch of cards with like just, just random pictures on them mm-hmm. uh, to, to assemble a story. But what I like about your cards is there is no, there's no pictures on them. It, yeah. They're just the runes. So they don't affect your subconscious. Right. And, and that's, what I think is really powerful about this, you know, the, the tarot cards and, and, and uh, the Dixit that you mentioned. Yeah. You, you look at them and, you know, I mean, they can be good for, uh, you know, writing exercises or, or writing sprints or something, write a story about this card. Uh, and you kind of have your scene, you've got your characters presented there. Um, you may even have a very clear conflict or antagonistic force, what have you. Um, and, and there's, definitely value in that. I don't want to belittle that at all. But what I find fascinating about the runes, um, they're, they are, they're very abstract. Um, if, if your listeners aren't familiar, so the runes are essentially the alphabet of the ancient Norse. So you have figures that look like the letter B, that look like the letter S or M or U and, and whatnot. Um, you know, so they're sort of familiar, but they're a little bit exotic and different um but each one has a sound value the letter value and it's a b a b sound um they also have sort of a meaning um so in this case the letter b in the runes is called berkino and it literally means the birch tree and then from there you expand on a whole bunch of different meanings for it um and things of that nature so what i think is really powerful about this system and because when you get stuck writer's block is really your left brain just being paralyzed um you know the left brain as far as writing goes is the editor um the part that knows how to put a sentence together and syntax and you know things of that nature and the right brain um 
is really more the seat of creativity. And I, I use that phrase and, and I, I, I stop for a minute because in part of mine, we can kind of go into this later, but part of my um, philosophy is that story exists independently of the writer, um, that we are not creating, oh. that, that we're not really creating the story. It's kind of, um, you know, Plato had the realm of ideal or ideas where a tree exists in principle before it, becomes a seed and 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 that ideal kind of forms the matrix that the seed then grows into um and kind of with you know the monomyth and jung's uh, collective unconscious these are all similar ideas just expressed differently sometimes but that that's kind of my thought as well is that you know this notion of we'll say the queen of sheba story exists and provides a matrix that then you know, the seed of the story was implanted within me, you know, and, and so the soil of my mind gave it a different characteristic than other stories, but it's all growing within this matrix of the idea of the Queen of Sheba. Wow. You're, you're really kind of blowing my mind right now <laughs> because just when you said that, I don't know if you've read like Brandon Sanderson's, um, Oh, now, of course, my my brain just dumped the name because I was thinking about it. But uh, his, his big stories with Shalon and everything. I can't I can't. Right. Remember yeah, yeah. Right uh, but he has a whole thing where they go into Shadesmar and there are these little like round pellet things that are the potential of like a tree or something. like right. that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and and, yeah, and it's I really think, cool. You know, yeah, it's 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 a little esoteric. It's a little out there, but you know, my experience has borne it out. Um, you know, I will, uh, a lot of time with, I think all the stories that, um, that I've written to date, there have been notions of ideas that have come to me that are completely outside of my experience, um, that have, you know, no business being in my head in any practical terms. And then I would go to research and I would find that, whatever that idea was, was a real thing and had direct impact on my story. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a little uh, kind of creepy sometimes, but it's really interesting and where it comes into where the power of this is for me as a writer. Um, and as we're talking about writer's block, you know, if, if I'm not creating the story, then I'm not responsible for, you know, e either the great flow of ideas or when I'm stuck. And, and my contention is when we get stuck, it's because we're stuck in the left brain. We're trying to, um, you know, to, to, to manhandle, to, to, to drag. rationalize something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're, we're trying to create a story rather than allowing the story that already exists to kind of funnel through us. And the right brain is that funnel, you know, it turns those ideas into more concrete things. So the, you know, the whole idea of, of using the runes, which are, are very abstract and have, you know, I've got uh, within the book, and I think I, I showed it to you, you know, I've got a matrix, um, which the left brain loves, you know, we've got this little spreadsheet um, set up with here's what the rune name is and here's its its letter value its sound here's the the literal interpretation of it these are the keywords that go around with it and so while the left brain is trying to categorize a particular rune and what it means and what it looks like the right brain is over here going oh well how does this impact the story you know we could use this and yeah that's the you know the european bison card but in this context of forces of opposition, maybe it's a super soldier, um, you know, so uh, it, it, it really kind of distracts the left brain and allows the right brain to connect back to that, uh, that realm of creativity, that source of story, dial back in and get the story flowing again. Yeah, that's, that's super cool. Uh, I want to ask you about something, though, because you were talking about like getting in your own way. Yeah. Um, one of the things that ex I experience in my own writing is that I can change the story as long as it's in my head. Like as long as it's in my head, mm. I can change whatever about the story I want until I write it down. And then that's the <laughs> way it happened. 
Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've experienced anything like that. Uh, uh, somewhat. Yeah. And it's been, and I will get stuck on that sometimes of, I could go this way. Okay. I could go this way. And, and um, you know, kind of going down a rabbit hole and it's almost a fear to commit to it because what if I make the wrong choice, <laughs> at least for me, um, you know, and then I'm stuck with it. Um, but, you know, the reality is it's not, it's not a joy to go back and rewrite things, but it's always a possibility. Um, you know, and it, it's, it, if you never get it written, then there's nothing to rewrite. So it, it's really kind of one of those things of, um, you know, it can be painful and scary to, to create something, you know, and there's yeah. uh, the, this whole, um, uh, think, um, oh, shoot now his name's escaping me, uh, gates of fire, um, Stephen Pressfield. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he talks about, um, resistance as a, an actual force, uh, kind of independent of a person. And his thing is that if you're, you know, sitting around playing Warcraft and, and, and eating Cheetos, resistance will leave you alone. Um, but as soon as you pick up a pen or, or grab your keyboard and begin creating something and creating something of value, that's when resistance jumps up and says, whoa, whoa, whoa there, fella. <laughs> Let's not yeah, get too yeah, crazy here. What are you doing? You're not good enough to write this story. Exactly. And and his thing is to celebrate that. You know, if if you've gotten resistance's attention, if it's really if it's put its focus on you, that means you're starting to do something powerful. So, you know, for me that that's actually a a good sign when I'm I'm feeling stuck and I'm feeling like I really don't want to do this and it's worthless. And I have no business doing that. That's when I know I'm on to something. And that if I kind of lean into it and press through that resistance, um, you know, even better things are going to happen. It's, yeah. it's, it, it, you know, it's like working out. If you work out with a five pound uh, dumbbell, you'll get somewhere, you know, you're going to make something happen, but not a lot. And, and so as, as you gain strength, you're going to face even greater resistance, but that just helps you gain even more strength and more yeah, confidence. Yeah. Well, that's, that's huge. Like that you don't, you don't get stronger by lifting the weight you can already lift. Exactly. <laughs> like you have yeah. to like push exactly. yourself to lift, you know, to your, to your breaking point to where you can't do things anymore. And right. then, um, it's funny because I, I was telling a couple of my friends the other day that I was really, really stressed out because uh, I think I'm tackling a little bit too much. But I I said, uh, and this has happened to me throughout my entire life, but I go, I'm either really, really close to failure or I'm about to level up. You know, and I put mm -hmm. it in like yes. gaming terms because <laughs> that's what I know. So it's yeah. like, um, but yeah, you can't level up until you're about to fail. That's that's exactly. the stakes, you know, and yep. it ties into what we were talking about earlier about the whole creative inertia that, you know, if you, if you are comfortable and never move or anything, there's no story. There's you're staying in the ultimate, uh, ordinary world, you know, Bilbo stays at bag end <laughs> and never finds the ring and Sauron never gets right. taken out. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. Yep. That's exactly it. All right. So I'm going to break into a couple other stories. We already, or not stories, questions. We already covered some of the writer's block stuff and everything, but, uh, okay. So imagine there's an alternate reality, uh, where you could have written any book other than the ones you've written. Um, so which one, which book do you, would you like to have written in this alternate reality? Oh, that's a great question. I love that. Um, I would have to say Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, Dumas. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I, I love Dumas and his storytelling. Um, and there's something, you know, the theme of that, I mean, just slaughtering your enemies is, is kind of good in any, <laughs> any time frame. Um, but no, the theme of that book has always resonated with me. Um, and just, you know, the, this guy that's seen, you know, unbelievable injustice and to be able to one wreak vengeance, but then also have that, um, that anger, quelled at the end and and kind of redeem himself and find forgiveness both for himself and for those who wronged him um i just think that's a hugely powerful story and 
would love to have, have been responsible for that one. Yeah, that's uh, it's one of my favorite books. And and uh, on the on the along those lines, I may plug another book. Have you read uh, the Black Count? And I don't remember who wrote it now. Yes, um, I I think on your recommend. I don't know if I've read. It. I have it. I have not read it yet. Um, on your recommendation, I did get it though. And uh, yeah, it's it's an, un, an unbelievable true story about um, Alexander Dumas' father. Yeah, who was like a general in Napoleon's army. And a lot of the exploits that Dumas wound up putting in his stories, like D'Artagnan fighting, fighting three duels in one day, his father actually did that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. yeah. So I, every time somebody expresses a love for Dumas, I'm like, Hey, you need to read this book. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I need to move that to the top of my stack now. And then, uh, another, another, uh, quick question is, uh, how big a part does music play in like creating your zone or getting you into a creative mood or something like that? Uh, another really good question. It's, it helps a lot. Um, you know, we'll, and kind of depending on my scene, most of the time, um, you know, I've got uh, Lorena McKenna on, on, oh, yeah, uh, on yeah. repeat. <laughs> um, you know, her songs are, are really evocative and they're kind of timeless, you know, I mean, they, they, they fit almost any era that, um, that I'm, I'm trying to write. And I've got, um, uh, a, a Scottish background. So her Celtic stuff, I really enjoy, uh, helps set the scene. I also find, um, I think you also introduced me to two steps from hell. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> this great, just cinematic soundtrack. So if I'm doing a battle scene, if I'm, you know, doing, um, uh, setting up a scene that just has a lot of intense action going on, I will definitely have them playing. So just, I, and I think, I think it's a real thing. Uh, you know, I know some people who need absolute silence to be able to write, but I think subliminally, you know, and at the subconscious level, music really sets a tone and our minds engage with that uh, at, at a certain level. And I think that really helps us get us into that place and into that scene and that um, that way of being and of feeling that is associated with that kind of music uh, that, that's relevant to the scene. You know, if you're uh, if you've got Enya on and are writing a a chase or a battle scene, that may not be the most conducive. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if it's in a more philosophical uh, setting, you know, and a uh, or a a, a romantic situation then maybe that's a better choice um, but I, th I think that's a real a very real thing um, and definitely uh, try to have that helping me out yeah and I, I also love Lorena McKenna except for there's one song when it comes on I can't listen to it anymore because it takes yeah. me to a, a dark oh. place and sure. it's uh, I think it's called The High Women and it's based on a poem by Burns I think Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I love the song, but I can't use it when, <laughs> when creating stuff. Cause I'll just go right to the dark side. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a gorgeous song, but it's, it, it is, she's got a number of those, um, that are really powerful and, and they can definitely, and sometimes it just, I get lost in the song and I realize I haven't typed anything for seven minutes. Cause... <laughs> um, do any of your novels carry a message? I, th I think they do. Um, you know, I definitely have a very, you know, if you, if you look across all my stories, I think there's a very strong theme of uh, freedom, of justice and truth. And, and these are things that are personally very important to me. You know, I, I never have them, you know, wrap up at the end and say, you know, I learned something today. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm, I, I'm not preachy about it. I don't think, um, you know, if you want to be preaching in your writing, write op-eds um, or sermons. But, you know, I, I really think writers are the shamans of, of today. You know, the shamans back in, in tribal times were, they were the storytellers, they were the myth makers, and they were responsible for the health and well-being of the tribe. Um, and I really think in, in, in of course, I think everyone comes in their lives comes to a point where now more than ever, we need something. Um, but now more than ever, <laughs> we need powerful <laughs> stories, you know, and we need cultural healing and we need, um,
people to to understand you know their personal meaning their meaning in society and relationship to their families um so i i think storytellers if they want to now people are always going to be uh looking for great entertainment with or without uh, a lesson but i think if we can entertain and uplift and help others level up and to evolve personally i think we're, we're missing out on a great opportunity if we don't do that um you know so I'm, I'm never gonna hand someone my book and here you need to read this and, and turn your life around but if i can subtly inspire someone through my character's actions through their successes or failures um or, or by example if something clicks in them and a few years down the road they find themselves in a situation and because they have experienced through story someone facing challenges and overcoming them or battling their inner demons or what have you but it, you know i think we have the opportunity to plant those seeds in people um and 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 make a positive change through storytelling i think that's a a very powerful opportunity yeah it, it's funny you mentioned that that uh you know folks have experienced it through like your writing because there were there's been some neurological experiments or whatever proof that show that like if you're reading a very descriptive scene about running that the same areas of your brain that would light up when you are running light up. Yeah. Uh, so, so it, it is kind of like, Hey, this is the safe, you know, simulation test run for when you run into these things. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I, it, I agree it is really cool. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I know the answer to this one already, but, uh, <laughs> Have you ever incorporated something that happened to you in real life into your novels? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, there, there have been it, – sometimes it's a throwaway line that that I've said or someone else has said that, that finds its way in there. Um, there are a handful of scenes that um, are, are kind of recounting events that happened in my life or, you know, family lore – um, things of that nature, the, uh, kind of the, the biggest level or the largest scale use of that, uh, is in my, my first novel of ashes and dust. Um, pretty much the entire novel was based on a, a personal experience. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to get a bit esoteric I'm here in, now in, because in I'm like, so. well, that whole novel <laughs> takes place in the late 1800s. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you're not that old. So. <laughs> I'm not quite that old no. Um, But we were living in uh, Richmond, Virginia at the time. And a friend of mine, I was doing a lot of theater. Um, so, you know, immersed and I've always been immersed kind of in both the left and right brain worlds, um, but doing theater and a friend of mine was studying to be a, uh, past life regression therapist. Um, and for those who don't know what that is, it's basically psychotherapy, taking people back to past lives to help them solve, you know, uh, whatever issues or challenges they may be going through in this lifetime. Um, and I had, I was just getting into esoteric things at that time. And so I was like, reincarnation, I don't know. That's kind of, kind of weird, but you know, she's a friend, she needs some help, I'll, I'll help her out. So I go in, it's kind of the, you know, she's sitting in her analyst chair, she's got the, um, you know, the, uh, the fainting sofa or whatever. So, you know, take, take the, uh, the psychotherapy position. Okay. And, and, uh, you know, she kind of starts leading me through it. And we spent an hour going through these, through, through her, regimen through her thing. When I came out, I had four very distinct, very clear scenes that became the foundation of that book. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, you know, it was, it was, I never felt like I was unconscious. You know, I felt very consciously aware and kind of, you know, she would ask a question about, you know, well, what do you see? I said, well, <laughs> the inside of my eyelids, but I, I, I think I see, a field of wheat um, and walk, running through, walking through it and running my hands over the tops of the, you know, the, the stalks of wheat or whatnot. And it kind of went on like that where I was like, am I making this up? Is this happening? You know, so to this day, I couldn't 
tell you that I experienced my past life, but um, there were definite moments in that. And of course, you know, it's largely set in the Civil War and the American West and the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, which I knew about, but was never, you know, had never really dug into the history of that, um, of that era too deeply. And um, as I was, you know, once I got those ideas, like, I don't know if that was real or not, but this would be a really interesting story. As I began writing it, this would, there were several occasions of all well, from a, a, a dramatic standpoint, I need something like this, this, and this to happen. And I went and did some research and found that, oh, in uh, Pea Ridge, Arkansas, outside of Bentonville, in 1863, this, this, and this actually happened. Oh, wow. That's really cool. <laughs> I'm like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm not fully committed to the idea, but um, through whatever mechanism, uh, I, I tapped into a really interesting story. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so there's that. Maybe it's not for my own life, but, you know, yeah, I, I <laughs> I only have a couple more questions because we're coming up on an hour now. But uh, okay, okay. Have you ever written any fan fiction? I have not. Um, I've well, none that I would show to anyone <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, when I was a kid, I wrote a lot of really bad science fiction, and at that, you know, it was knockoff of of Star Trek. Um, I think you know I've toyed with the idea of of writing a uh, a Dumas continuation, oh, cool. um, you know, a, a, a later years or another generation of the Musketeers, something like that. Um, so that would technically qualify, I think, but, um, uh, yeah, most of the things I'm a, a big fan of are still, I, I hope they, they have many, many more novels to come from it. I don't want to piss off. Yeah, the author yeah. before, uh... <laughs> no, understood. Okay. So, uh, uh, people often like gravitate to different interests uh, throughout their lives. So what story do you feel like most influenced you um, either as a child or as an adult or whatever? And this could be anything like books or TV or through whatever medium. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say Jules Verne stories probably had a, a really big impact on me um, and maybe part of how and why I became an engineer uh, you know, that kind of that connection of uh, technology, science and creativity all together um, and, and how uh, a, a creative use of science can help solve you know, a, a global problem in the story um, or a, a character's situation, um, you know, technology you know, it, it's a two-edged sword, sometimes literally, um, where technology can create as many or more problems than it solves. Um, but we're going to need technology of one form or another to solve the problems that we've gotten into. So, and I think Vern had a, a really interesting way of presenting uh, those, both the challenges and the, uh, the, the, the miracles, the benefits that the technology offers. And I think that really kind of had a big impact uh, throughout, uh, through my formative years. Okay. And uh, for our, our, well, what about as, as a grown up? Um, yeah, I think what I've, I've really found, and I've begun, it's probably not a great habit. I've begun reading less and less as I've been writing more and more. Um, you know, you only have so much time. Um, but I've, I've really, I've learned, I think, from my characters as, as, as much as I think I've instilled into them. And, you know, as you, and I've learned a lot about psychology to, to craft a character, to make a really full-blown three-dimensional character. And as I've learned about those items, and then I look in a mirror and it's like, oh, <laughs> so I guess maybe I can apply that to, to make myself a little bit better and, and, and better figure out how I navigate this world as well as how my character should navigate the story world. Um, so I think just the, you know, there, there's not a, a book or a series so much as just the, the, the art of storytelling has really 
inspired and empowered me to begin writing my own life rather than just being a passive. Oh, uh, oh secondary, instead of secondary being a passenger or whatever, you know, the pilot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. That's, that's really cool. And uh, uh, learning from your characters too is funny. I was talking to Penny. I'm, I'm writing a novella right now that, that I'm getting stuck on a lot of just points that I shouldn't. And it was just really mm. cool. And I told her, Hey, I'm finally there on the right track because my, my protagonist essentially disagreed with me when I was going to have her, <laughs> her do something. She was just like, I would never say that. Like, that's just, and I was like, Oh, finally, right. like you're talking now. Like, <laughs> right. uh, like you finally like come into your own, you know? So that was really cool. That's all, yeah. I mean, cause you know, if they stop talking, it's like, okay, I'm going down this road. If you don't like it, you, you know, yeah, speak up. Exactly. <laughs> and then, um, for our last question, this is the, uh, I always ask this question is like, do you have any advice you want to give to writers that are yet to be published or even, you know, just nascent authors or storytellers or whatever? Yeah. I mean, I, I've got to say, and, and you know, this as, as well as anyone of, publishing is a, a challenging business. Um, and if you're not passionate about storytelling, don't, don't bother, <laughs> save yourself the headache. Um, but if you are passionate, if you have a story that needs to be told and needs to be told through you, do not stop. You find a way to get that out into the world. I, you know, in, in my own case, um, how my stories have gotten out were not what I had in mind, um, but they're happening and they're in the world and, you know, they are touching people. I won't necessarily go so far as to say they're changing lives, but they, they are reaching people. And so if you have that story within you, you do it, whatever it takes to get it out there and you do not stop. Yeah, that is excellent advice because um, it's it's really easy to quit <laughs> and just give up. But uh, sure. that's yeah. the easy thing. Like that's the easy road. You know, right. it's just like okay, well, exactly. Um, and, <laughs> and if you could let everyone know where you can be found online, you know, on Twitter or Facebook or wherever. Uh, sure, um, you can find me at uh, mark gramcom dot com. It's m a r c hyphen g r a h a m dot com. Um, the Mark Graham without the hyphen was taken by a, a punk rocker <laughs> in the UK. So um, that's the easiest way. And then that will get you to uh, to my Facebook, to Twitter, um, to Google Plus, which I think I've checked this year. Um, and uh, we'll also have links there to the, the Runes for Writers series um, to, and to all my books you can find through the website. Yeah, because that's right. You have like uh, you've done some YouTube videos where you go over that stuff. Yeah. 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 And so on YouTube, you can find me at uh, the source of story channel. And um, yeah, I've gone through, I've got a few demos of the different ways that I've used uh, the runes for story development. And I, <laughs> if we've got, I gotta tell you, I, so I've, I've led a few workshops with these um, and done readings for other people. Honestly, I hadn't done one for myself oh. yet. Um, and so as I'm developing the, uh, the, the guidebook, the manual that will accompany the series, there is a narrative thread, um, you know, kind of a, a creative writing thread that will go through. And I just figured I should maybe not be a hypocrite and actually <laughs> use, use the layouts. You know, I, I knew I needed to do sample layouts. I said, well, I'll just do it for this, this thread. And and that's what is in these these four videos of the different layouts and i <laughs> you know i've seen the power and i've seen how they apply to stories that i've known nothing about when i've done readings for these other people and then as i do these layouts for my own story that i kind of had an idea of what it was going to be and then bam it just comes into crystal clear focus of this is exactly who this character is and this is what's happening in the scene and this is why and here's the entire story in nine cards it's like it works <laughs> um so yeah those those four videos are on the source of story youtube channel which are also linked uh through my website okay great and uh that's probably going to do it for this episode 
and I will let Mark go and go and uh, check out all of his stuff and everything. And I'm really looking forward to the Song of Songs and really looking forward to the Prince of the West because I haven't read that one yet. So. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was after your time or before your time. So awesome. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate you having me on. You have been listening to Quantum Froth Dispatches by Michael Haspel. Music and other cues are provided by The Fat Rat. The song you're hearing is Monody, featuring Laura Brem. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit www.patreon.com slash QFD. Thank you for listening, and we now return you to your mundane reality.